Without grammar and spell check, I would have been very nervous to present to you tonight. <clears throat> Thank God for technology, right? Like, um, welcome. We're totally going to cover a bunch of stuff this evening. Above all self, our children need to be able to read and to write. I cannot stress enough the impotence of setting higher standards. Yes, it's the only way to ensure that our children can move forward in a rapidly changing word. They need to be able to speak with convicts. They need to be able to say that they are mean and be mean in what they say. We must remind them that one day they will stand before a room choke full of people and it really won't matter. Hyperbole and humor aside, this is the reality of 21st century education. Generation gaps. They've been around for, well, generations. And without a doubt, the process has been that we learn from those before us and move forward as a society and as learners. Typically, this takes place over the course of an entire generation, until now. I refer to this modern phenomenon as the 730-day gap. Two years. Our children are changing the way they access and communicate information every two years. Brad Stone, in his uh, New York Times article titled The Children of Cyberspace, Old Fogies by Their Twenties, concluded that researchers theorize children today are experiencing multiple mini-generational gaps uh, as a result of being on the forefront of technological tools in their formative stages. Imagine the impact this has on our ability to write curriculum, on our ability to connect with our students. But does it really matter how they access and communicate, whether it's in the form of an old-fashioned book, or a digital text, a human face, a set of lips, or even an emoji? The intentions are always crystal clear. But the real trouble begins when educators fail to recognize that this is a part of a group of learners whose refresh rates are instant. FOMO. It's an acronym which stands for the fear of missing out. Our young children today can develop anxieties over the thought that if they are not connected right now, they're going to miss out on something really big in their world. And this is exactly how they're entering our classrooms. It's exactly how they're entering our assignments. And it's exactly how we are entering, how they are entering our conversations together. And if we continue to ignore this 21st century learning curve, the generation gaps are going to widen exponentially. Which is why I propose a new meaning for the acronym. Today, educators have a wonderful chance to feed open minds opportunities. We have an opportunity to create authentic classrooms today, to spark ingenuity, and to offer real innovation with the children. And the open-mindedness is a result of accessing some of these new technologies today. About 10 years ago, I realized something, and that was that just about all of my music that I enjoyed was considered completely out of touch. And in fact, just about everything that I had a passion for and loved, the kids considered so yesterday. I used to uh, think, besides the occasionally really cool kid whose parents rocked out to the Grateful Dead or the Almond Brothers, that uh, maybe one day they would grow up and head off to college and start listening to some awesome music and reading great poetry like Collins or Bukowski and say, oh my god, man, Mr. Koch was like way ahead of his time. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. I really wasn't connecting with my kids the way they were. I wasn't accessing social media like they did. I certainly wasn't keeping up with the Kardashians. And I definitely had no reason to own a smartphone, smartphone or so I thought. About 10 years ago, I swallowed the truth. And the truth is, kids today, you've got about one minute to wow. And if we keep pushing the same scripted 
primitive educational model down their throats, they're going to throw it up. We need to offer the kids an opportunity to showcase their identities and who they are. These are the basic principles of adolescent psychology. So one way in which I combated the system and bucked the trends of putting all my eggs into the baskets of standardized testing was to give these kids an opportunity. I started an in-house publishing network where kids would bring their ideas to the table and work on poetry and work on manuscripts, DIY manuals, and we'd send them out to various markets across the country. And over the course of several years, they've had wonderful success. But it's not the accolades that were really important. It's what these kids actually had to say. 12 and 13 year olds sharing profound ideas on topics like abuse and divorce and relationships, fitting in, acceptance. And every morning before school, during my prep periods, during lunchtime, my classroom becomes a haven for the social pariahs, the misfits, the emo kids, the bullied, every once in a while, a William Shakespeare type. And we talk about plot structure changes, and sentence structure changes, and word choice over a game of chess, or the latest YouTube video gone viral. And that's when I really believe we become teachers. Those are the real teachable moments when I fully understand who my children are and what they want to become as opposed to what we keep forcing them to be. The 21st century science of understanding involves breaking the rules a little bit and sometimes it's going to piss off a few colleagues along the way and it's definitely going to break your union negotiated contract hours, but the rewards are immeasurable. And I think we've come a long way. We've almost mastered the science of numbers, data crunching, standardized test score analysis. But in the end, is it possible that we have lost our art of understanding the children? Thank you.